Welcome to Leaders with Heart. I'm your host, Paddy McDonald, and today we're speaking with Kale Costa, who is a former professional MMA fighter who had title fights in Australia and they were televised globally in front of thousands of people in the ring. And it was interesting to hear his journey from being bullied in the playground to mastering this physical realm and the courage that it took to go deep into the physical battles but then even deeper to look inside into the spiritual battles that were driving him to that level of, of success, but also of challenge. And through integrating that spiritual and psychological lens of the world, he's now found a deeper level of fulfillment than he's ever seen before. And he now helps men around the world to also find this integration through his programs, such as the Conscious Warrior program and what i really loved about this conversation is the switch in perspective that he shared from looking at life through the lens of a fighter to looking at it through the lens of a martial artist and the subtle distinction that comes when we step into a place of creation over conflict and so the lessons from this are applicable to all areas of our life especially business and leadership so I hope you enjoy, and as always, please feel free to connect with either Kale or myself on the back of this conversation. Take care. Here today with Kale Costa, and super excited to dive into this conversation with you today, brother, because you're someone who I've seen referred to as the soul warrior, creator of the program, the conscious warrior. And for me, this is something that really speaks to my heart in the way that you've really obtained a level of mastery in these multiple different fields, you know, the physical realm with your martial arts and then the spiritual realm with a lot of your yoga and meditation practices and even the psychological realm as well. I know you've got a lot of beautiful learnings to share as well. So I'm really excited to have you on the podcast, man. Thank you for being here. Ah, thanks for having me. Super excited to yeah do my first podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, man. Amazing. Um, so just to start off, love to hear more about you and more about how you've become who you are so sometimes the easiest way to start this is to go back to the beginning and <laughs> you know those first seeds of what sparked some of this growth you mm. know the call to action on the hero's journey so to speak hero's journey i love that <laughs> um yeah so i guess like i um grew up you know reading a lot of fantasy books and interested in a lot of spirituality and um what actually probably led me here was I spent a lot of my time through my primary school and high school years getting bullied severely and assaulted a bunch of times. And yeah, that led to like a really strong pendulum swing, um, doing martial arts. And I remember there was like this pivotal turning point when I was 16. Um, up until that point, I was like reading the Bhagavad Gita and books on Tibetan Buddhism by Geshe Kelsang Gatso and, um, collecting crystals as a 15, 16 year old wow, kid. <laughs> and, um, for a -old. Yeah. Like, you know, I grew my hair long and was like, um, I'd walk my dog with my goat and I was like, played the harmonica. <laughs> and then I just got, um, makes sense now why I got assaulted. But, um, <laughs> that, um, yeah, got bashed one too many times, I guess when I was 16. And then that set me on like a pretty hardcore path to never be a victim again. And, yeah, went off and did martial arts and got my black belt in Taekwondo and started teaching, then started competing and doing boxing, kickboxing, Thai boxing, K1, Muay Thai, and had maybe like 70 amateur, 20 professional fights in that. And then, um, yeah, started training in like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, got my black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and did some Judo and wrestling and had seven cage fights and um, thinking I was going to find this happiness that I had that I get at the end of becoming like a world UFC champion or something like that. And, um, yeah, kind of become a father along the way and realize what was important and managed to step off that, step off that path. And got mm. to a point where it's like, I felt like I could be myself again and didn't need to have the mohawk and be the fight guy. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was probably like maybe six, seven years ago. And then, um, started getting back into, you know, reading on Buddhism and practicing yoga and meditation and, um, yeah, then, you know, took an initiation in a, um, Tibetan Buddhist temple in Belgrave or took refuge, I should say. 
I went and studied again in a temple, in a couple of temples in Thailand, and then uh, stayed and studied in a temple in um, Warburton, the Bodhavana Buddhist monastery. And mm. yeah, along that way, it was like open a martial arts club and taught for like a number of years. I still have it, but now it's like, yeah, half owner and coaching a lot less, which is good. So Yeah, amazing, mm. man. It's definitely been a diverse journey for you and beautiful to hear that. And I'd love to actually dive a bit deeper into some of those parts there because I think there's so much mm. gold in what you've already shared. And mm. going back to that time as a, as a teenager, like I can relate, man. Like I definitely know the feeling of being bullied and of like really, well, for me anyway, just questioning who I am, like is who I am good enough to be accepted in the world and, you know, let alone just to not be assaulted, right? Like that's pretty challenging initiation for someone who is still finding out who they are. And it sounds like for you, you know, finding martial arts really helped you feel safer and more solid in yourself. Is that fair to say? Yeah, hundred percent. Like grew up without a dad. Like I hadn't seen him since I was like three or four years old. And um so I always like the male martial arts coach like filled that role model figure, I think, that I was like craving or that yeah, that masculine presence. And um yeah, definitely like big initiation. I remember I was like lying on my back holding this Jordan Peterson fantasy book wheel of time or something. I was like holding it in front of my face while I was getting punched and I remember thinking like it was time to um be like the character in the books and act, but actually step out of the book and, you know, as you say, go on my own hero's journey type thing. And yeah, started training intensely and um, went from like a, you know, those goats where you make a loud noise and they freeze and fall over. <laughs> it was like, um, I was like that through like my primary and high school years, like any violence, physical aggression or um, verbal aggression, I would like just play dead and wait for him to get bored. And then, yeah, a number of years later, I was like, you know, won a number of title belts and fought around Australia and fought on Foxtel and, um, yeah, stepped up to a much bigger level. And then, yeah, now comfortable being uncomfortable if there was, ever, you know, ever anything like physical violence or whatnot. We're back just working with some technical difficulties, but <laughs> keep the conversation going. So awesome. that's beautiful, man. And I really want to hear a bit more about your journey as a fighter because, as you said, like you're able to really compete at some of the top levels in this country and can only imagine that the pathway to that point had a lot of challenges but also therefore a lot of lessons and gifts as well. Um, what do you recall from that time of really striving to reach those heights you know it's funny like i um i can't remember all of the opponents names or fights like i had 20 professional kickboxing k1 muay thai fights seven cage fights and like probably 100 amateur and um yeah i just remember i was always like training for the next fight training for the next fight and i was just like i was trying to you know climb up this ladder or run up this hill and it's like once i get over the next hurdle the next hurdle and I know that like I was, you know, I'd always be terrified going into it. Um, a lot of people would be like, nah, I'm not scared before the fight. Like I was absolutely petrified. Like I'd be backstage um, thinking of any excuse that I could quit or roll, pretend to roll my ankle or um, like the battle inside your mind, like, you know, because you're trying to step into a ring or a cage against an angry person trying to hurt you. Um, but I felt like I needed to do it to, you know, just keep conquering this fear or, um yeah, and building up this, like, yeah, massive resilience and tolerance to it. Massive, like, seeking resolution pendulum swing, though. <laughs> Didn't need to swing that far, but... <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'm hearing, obviously, you know, this is just me perceiving your story, but I'm hearing that, like, all the beauty and the power that came from that pendulum swing as well, that, you know, kind of everything having its perfect place in your story... So who knows what else is coming mm -hmm. on the back of all of that as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's um, When I got back into yoga and picked back up where I felt like I left off at 16, then again at like say 30, um, since then I did like, you know, four yoga teacher trainings and breathwork facilitation training and um, developed like a really strong yogic practice under a teacher. And 
Um, but like, I, was, I think I was a little bit resentful for a little while of the martial arts, thinking that I'd wasted a lot of my time on it. And um, but then it's opened up like the most amazing doors where I can go into like high schools and I run these like youth programs and um, you've got a bunch of like disengaged youth, especially teenage boys and it's at schools where it's like they've been kicked out of mainstream schooling and um, they're trying to get them engaged or maybe they've just got out of juvie or about to go. And like if I rock up and I'm like, hey, my name's Kale, I like to do yoga and meditate and walk a goat. Um, it's like, let's all sit down, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm probably not going to get them engaged, yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, walking yeah. into a group of teen yeah. boys or, you know, getting men in and it's like, yeah, you know, I used to fight professionally. I've got a number of black belts. I won some title belts. Let's do some martial arts training. And then, um, you kind of get their respect and you've like, you know, you get them on the hook and then they want to learn off you. They think you're cool for choice of a better word. And then, at the end of it, it's like, all right, guys, like, let's do something that the Navy SEALs use, which is called um, box breathing. It's like, you know, going to help your performance or you might like introduce them to some breath work or bring in like the Bushido code from the samurai, which is, you know, very similar to the um, yamas and niyamas from yoga or, um, yeah, different like, you know, Ten Commandments in Christianity or something. So it's, um, yeah, it kind of mm -hmm. gives them what they need wrapped in what they want. So, like put the medicine in the dog's food and then, you know, the dog eats the food, but it gets the medicine. Sure, man. Sure. Yeah. It's been powerful mm. medicine. Like I, I really want to hear more from your perspective as well about like the actual application of some of these tools too, because, you know, you and I both have firsthand experience of how some of these spiritual tools have revolutionized our own lives. But like in terms of explaining it to people and getting other people to want to actually try these out um you've found a way to bridge that through martial arts for example but can you speak a bit to how these tools have practically supported you know let's say your fighting career or your business in setting up your gym or you know, any, anything that is tangible that people can start to really see the stakes here or the importance of you know, some of these tools that we're talking about yeah, so I feel like, um, say, take like a yoga practice or a breath work or a meditation practice. It's um, it's probably the best thing you can do for yourself in terms of like alleviating stress or anxiety or helping increase like, you know, different serotonin or dopamine in the brain with doing um, like to help counter depression. Um, and probably the best analogy I like to use would be um, it's like you've spent your whole life thirsty and with a headache. So it's like, you're born thirsty with a headache and 30 years later, that's just normal. So it becomes your new baseline. And then one day someone lets you drink as much water as you like. You have a couple of Panadol, a couple, couple of Nurofen. And all of a sudden you're like, I had no idea I could feel this good. And I feel like that's most people not realizing how good they can feel, how clear they can be, how um, mindful they can be. And we, they kind of get like caught up in, um, caught up viewing life through clouded lenses. So it's like, you know, we view life through mm. the lens of all of our past triggers, traumas, bad experiences, or samskaras is the word in Sanskrit. Um, and I feel like these practices help to clear the lens that we see life through so that maybe there's that ex-girlfriend that cheated on me 18 times in a row. And then I go into the next relationship rather than being paranoid and wondering what they're doing and all of my actions coming from a place of fear. Um, I can kind of clear the lens that I see life through, like know myself, um, know where it's coming from and step back a little bit to be the witness of it rather than in it and experiencing it and reacting from that place. So, yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where it almost, you know, needs to be done and experienced a bit to go, oh, like I, you know, can feel this good, think this clear and, yeah yeah for sure was there overlap for you in terms of your fighting career and then and the spirituality or did you fully exit one before starting the other well muay thai is really beautiful in that it's um in thailand the muay thai and the Theravada buddhism is like very closely intertwined so um i went to thailand a number of times and actually got to stay at temples over there and got to participate in some really cool rituals and um like most of the Thai culture is Buddhist. Um, and even in like the, when they're entering the ring, you'll see the Thai guys do three bows or wise, they call it in Thai. 
and like one's to Buddha, like Siddhartha Gautama, the, the Buddha, one's to Dharma, his teachings, and the other one's to Sangha, like the community. So it's like the Thais have like a very strong spiritual belief system in Muay Thai. It's very different to kickboxing or boxing where, you know, beautiful sport for sure, but it tends to be just a bit bash each other where um, the Thai boxing has a strong like respect element. And, um, and yeah, I really resonated with that. Like say you go to like maybe the pinnacle of kickboxing and you go to Holland or something and you see two guys fighting. Like when one person starts to maybe be hurt or you could go for the knockout, they'll go for the kill and try to knock the person out to get the win. Where um, in Thailand, like they're fighting for food, like they're fighting to support their family and um, they'll go really hard. But if they know they've won the fight and the other person's injured, like a lot of the time they'll carry them through the rest of the round and just play a bit so that that person gets to be healthy and fight again a couple of weeks later to support their family. So yeah, there was a beautiful overlap of um, well, starting to introduce that into the yeah into the combat side. You don't get it so much in um, I loved it in Muay Thai, but when I was competing in kickboxing, K1 and MMA, like yeah, it left a real bad taste in my mouth. Like you go fight on like an epic Thai show and um, the crowd's respectful and they're cheering and they're friendly and everyone's like you know wanting to you know talk to you or get an autograph or have a photo or whatever but then if you're fighting kickboxing or cage fighting um the crowds are just for choice of a better word flogs like they're um you got the guys wearing the tap out t-shirts with the gold chain and they're just jeering whoever's not their favorite and you know calling out names and um just really disrespectful and it's not a it's a fighter rather than a martial artist it's like there's a big difference and i feel like martial artists sure. maybe have like more of a code of honor, Bushido code um, mentality, think like George St. Pierre. And then you have the fighter mentality, like say Conor McGregor, where it's like, you think it's okay to throw a chair through a bus window at somebody. Mm, interesting. Interesting, man. Yeah, I really, it's a really interesting distinction you make there between fighter and martial artist. And ultimately, like we're talking about fighting here, but a lot of people listening to this might not actually do any fighting in their life um, and they might not have practiced martial arts before at all in their life. I'm one of these people who has done little bits here and there of Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu or things like that, but I've never fully got into it. But I really want to just highlight here that there's some interesting metaphors and there's some interesting ways that we can you know, view whatever our practice is in life through these lenses. And this one here you've called out of fighter versus martial artist is a really interesting one. And I'm just going to share my own take on what you've just shared. And I'd love your perspective on the back end, which is yeah, that yeah. to fight sees me as like other than the one I'm fighting. It's like I'm in opposition to something else outside of myself. And therefore, like, you know, like there's a win and a lose as well versus being a martial artist, like having the word artist in there is so beautiful Mm. because it's like, yeah, cool. Like we're creating, like we're actually like in a dance together and how can we have like some kind of symbiotic relationship where we lift up Mm. not only ourselves, but everyone who interacts and watches this as well. And it just like, I've never really thought of it that way until you expressed that just then. And I really, it makes me look at not only fighting a martial artist as in a different way, but also how I approach business, for example, you know, am I out there to compete with my competitors and dominate the market and win at all costs? Or am I out there to create a more beautiful world with my products and services? And there's actually shared mission with my competitors that, you know, we're all actually trying to do the same thing so why don't we actually like just be in it as a team in some ways you know there's some interesting distinctions that are coming Mm. from this thought dude and i'd love your reflections on that yeah definitely so i think um two elements to that it's like you've got say a fighter on one hand and a martial artist on the other and with a fighter i picture say nate diaz who's a famous ufc fighter who will go full-blown vegan um, so that he has less inflammation in his body and he trains his, like, you know, trains his ass off all the way up to um, the fight. And then post fight, he'll drink alcohol, smoke, and eat, you know, a whole bunch of meat. So it's like, it's not a sustained long term path that he's on. He's on like a fight camp and then he fights and he goes back to living how he'd normally live. And um, that would be like when you're looking at motivation, it's like someone's like outcome focused. So it's like the outcome is the fight. 
and that's where they get their motivation from, then a martial artist is like, say, more process orientated. So it's like I'm more interested in the process of I'm going to be a mixed martial artist or a martial artist for the rest of my life. And it doesn't matter whether I have an event coming up or not. I just want to be like 1% better every day. And every day I'm going to try and be better than me the day before. And like a perfect example of that would be George St. Pierre. He's like this amazing martial artist who has like a um, their beautiful mindset, super respectful, very honorable. And he's just always training. And it's, it's not like there's a camp and then he stops. He's just training forever and trying to be healthier and be better than what he was where, you know, I think if he stepped in today, X amount of years later, he'd be better than what he was when he left because he's still been working on himself. And you see it a lot in um, a lot of like high level sports and elite athletes where um, they reach a pinnacle or they retire. And most of them years later, they all put on a lot of weight because they're so used to like starving himself and then binging, starving himself and then binging like, or cutting weight for fights and stuff. And when that, outcome piece of the motivation's gone like they don't have the olympics coming up they don't have the nationals they don't have that professional fight it's like what are they training for like they're not training for anything because they need an event to train yeah. rather than the event just being life and i want to be healthy fit enjoy my body and pursue my art form whatever that is whether it's dance martial arts yoga and um and do that as like a that's me for the rest of my life rather than i need these events to train for mm. man that's really potent one of my best friends and mentors as well, uh, his name's Guy Newman, was an Olympian. And uh, he said that actually, like, one of the highest rates of depression is in Olympians after they finish their career because they have had this purpose for so long. They've been shooting for this thing and then it's gone. And, like, how is anything going to live up to that? And yeah, I'm, what I'm hearing in your piece here is that like by being so outcome oriented well then you know the outcomes got to keep growing to actually satiate that versus just mm. living for the practice living for the process kind of has its own self-fulfilling element to it that can extend beyond that and you know be translated into parenthood or be translated into relationship or you know whatever kind of service we want to bring into our communities and uh mm. Yeah, it feels like a really powerful lesson you're sharing here, man. Uh, the, um, there's, there's so much more on that depression piece with um, athletes, which it's like, it's huge where most people don't realize it, but like say your nervous system's used to operating between these levels and like you've got highs, you've got lows, and most people operate in the middle here. And when you're a high-level athlete and you're training hard every day and you have these big events and, you know, like I'd fight and have a 1,000 people watching live, the, like a 1,000 people in a venue be fighting camera crews on getting streamed on fox Tell around the world and it's like you literally become a drug addict to the adrenaline and the highs and the endorphin releases and even the cortisol and what happens is that you get addicted to these things but you also don't realize that you're naturally all day you're, you're operating at a higher level so it's like if here was my scale of like high and low most people are around here a lot of these athletes and fighters it's like you're up at this level and you're operating at a high level that's not sustainable forever, but this becomes a new baseline or norm. So then it happens in even AFL athletes, they get injured, so they can't train, so they can't get their their drug, their drug fix essentially, of like their um, you know, their adrenaline hits and their cortisol spikes and their um the endorphin releases from feeling so good at performing at a high level. And um, you know, their ego is even attached to it, but then they drop back to a normal level where everyone else is at, but because they've spent so long at a high level it feels like a crash and they don't know how to operate at a normal level without getting those fixes because they're so used to the, yeah, all of that coming in from the events and the training. Yeah, dude, this is massive. Like we all heard the stories, I think, when the GFC hit back in 2008 and, you know, people lost millions and were jumping out windows in uh, Wall Street high rises. And you know, mm. these are people that after having lost everything, may still have been in the top you know one percent of wealthiest people in the world just by nature of being in america and everything and you know not to not to minimize the suffering that they must have been feeling because obviously it was it was a lot but just wanting to like really highlight here that there is there are stakes here right this is a real human challenge that we all face in our own ways whether it be as an athlete or as a someone trying to make it in the world financially or for our families like there's a subtle distinction here that can change everything. And 
I, I love that we're focusing on this because <laughs> this shift from outcome to process is like it's so simple that it's so easy to miss yeah and so uh, i would love to hear you talk a bit more man about like how how you've journeyed with that and how you found your ways to like continually come back to process throughout your your life whether it be through martial arts or whether it be through meditation or spirituality mm, yeah well it's um it's still an ongoing battle so it's like i I trained a silly amount when I was competing. Like most people would have three professional fights in a year and that would be like a big camp. So you'd kind of peak three times over the space of a year where I remember like I had three professional fights in 10 days. So it's like I'm cutting like five to 10 kilos, weighing in, fighting, cutting, weighing in, fighting, cutting, weighing in, fighting. Like I was silly. Like I fought, I should have fought at 70 kilos, but I fought between 70 to 77. And, you know, I remember a time where there was a, um, there was a, my, my coach joked, he's like, oh, Costa, there's a the heavyweight pulled out for the Australian title belt in the heavyweight division. Do you want to fight it? And I'm like, yeah, sweet. I'm like, I'll jump in. And jumped in on like six days notice to fight for the Australian title in the heavyweight division against someone like, I couldn't even reach his head. Like he was, he obviously won. <laughs> but I, I spent so wow. long training. Tra- tra- <laughs> I spent so long training for all of these outcomes because my motivation was, um, was ex- like it's external motivation rather than like I want it to be intrinsic, like motivation and that should be coming from within me. So it's like right now even I, um, I want to book a jiu-jitsu competition or I want to maybe come back and just do one Thai boxing fight or something just because then I go, that'll make me train. But um, what I actually need to do is go, well, what do I want to look like and feel like and move like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? And you know, I want to be able to play with my kids and wrestle them when my son, he's six years old now. When he's 25, I'm hoping I can still beat him up. Like, it's, <laughs> I'm hoping I can still wrestle with him and, you know, play fight and muck around in the backyard and be able to go for a run with him or a hike. And um, and then when I have grandkids, I want to be the active granddad that's, like, stepping on the mats and wrestling with the kids and teaching them stuff. And um, I don't want to be that dad or grandfather mm-hmm. that's overweight and, you know, has heart conditions and, can have all the wealth in the world, but like I have a um, job I work at called the Empowered Man, um, where I work from a laptop during the day for them as well as doing my own stuff. And there's a lot of like high income earning men that are struggling with marital problems, and they've got like money that I'll never see, and um, but they're still you know unhappy or miserable or unfit, and um, marriages are you know turning to shit. And it's um, yeah, it's like I think the biggest wealth you have is your health. And I could have $10 million in the bank, but if I'm lying in a hospital bed and I'm unable to use it, um, it's no good to me if I can't, you know, go explore nature this weekend. So um, I think the best motivation is to always come back to that and go like, you know, do I want to be able to use my body? Do I want to be able to move it? Do I want to be able to run? Do I want to be able to pick something up off the ground? Do I want to be able to pick my kids up? Like it's, um, yeah, I think that it's important to remind ourselves of that. And we, we service our cars, right? Like, Every 10,000 Ks, I put my car in to get service because I don't want the motor to break down. What happens if I got given one car for the rest of my life from the moment I was born and you only had one car? You'd probably service it regularly. You'd put really good fuel in it, but you can always buy another car. Like we can't buy another body. I've got one body and why aren't we choosing to service our bodies by going, well, I'm going to service my heart with cardio, like cardiovascular training so that I have a healthy heart and lungs, like the number one cause of death in under 55s is heart attacks and strokes. So I should be training my heart and lungs so that I'm alive and, um, and you know, healthy. And then after 55, like you want to be focusing more on strength training. So if you, you get muscle atrophy and if you fall over and you break your hip or something, it's like your quality of life decreases and you see those old people that can't get in and out of the chairs very well. So it's like, I don't think it should be under 55s cardio, over 55 strength. We all should be doing cardio and strength as a part of our weekly regime because, you know, if I've got one car for the rest of my life, I want a nice big mm-hmm. motor in it. Like I don't want a Mac, ch- Mac truck chassis with a little Prius engine. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have, a, um, you know, I want the big engine or the big heart and lungs and yeah. I want a bit of a, you know, half decent chassis that can withstand whatever life throws at it. And mobility, range of motion, it's like, you know, if I can't touch my toes and I've got, no range of motion, I'm going to get injured easy and I, my range of motion, I start to lose. And, you know, where if I do regular mobility work and, um, or something like, you know, a daily yoga practice, which has so many other benefits, but, um, that's kind of like, you know, lubricating the joints and maintaining the range of motion. And 
So that's just like purely servicing our body and looking after us. And the motivation should be that for like, I'm going to keep myself fit, cardio, strength, range of motion, mobility. And I should be focusing on what do I want to look like, move like, feel like when I'm older. And um, yeah, taking that to another level, I'd be like, well, like my mind, my brain is like, the brain's probably the most complicated thing on the planet. Neuroscientists say we understand like 5% or something of it. Let's just check the human. But um, <laughs> then mm. we, like, why, why isn't everybody seeing a counsellor or a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a, why isn't everyone servicing their mind or their brain under a teacher, mentor, a therapist or coach, like at least once a month as maintenance? Like, um, you know, that's going to, I might be going performing mm. at some point, but, you know, every person that becomes suicidal or depressed or mentally unwell, they didn't plan, they didn't plan that to happen. It's like things just slowly deteriorate and then they kind of find themselves in a bit of a hole. So I think we should be like having motivation as well going, I don't want to end up like this. So here are these things I can put into place and, you know, have a teacher, have a mentor, have a therapist and like, you know, service your mind as well as your body and, and look after everything so that we can perform optimally at the level that we want to. Yeah, dude, I love that. I really love that. That metaphor is really striking for me about the car and having one car for our whole life. Like that's unthinkable yeah. to most people to have a like, <laughs> right. you know, like, upgrade every five years. <laughs> the cars, we can buy a yeah, I, I wow. could get a, I could have um, a shoulder reconstruction or a hip reconstruction, but you know, I've only got the one spine for the rest of my life and I'd probably rather avoid surgery and replacing parts in my body if I can help it. <laughs> totally, man. Totally. Um, do you have any examples from your, your path and your story on, you know, like some of those challenging times where you've needed to service your mind or seek support or anything and ways where that has really helped you get through to the next stage? Uh, massively. When I was, um, when I was fighting professionally, I was like a freight train where it's like I was going from A to Z and I wasn't, um, really available for anything else. I was just so focused on train, fight, compete, train, fight, compete. And it cost me friendships, cost me relationships. And um, you have to be very selfless to be a, an athlete. Like I think if you're a high level athlete, like you should be single. And um, I, you know, got married and I've got three beautiful children, but we got divorced five years ago. Like we weren't compatible and it was probably a bit broken from the start, but um, you know, beautiful woman and we have a good co-parenting relationship and, um, but five years ago, that was like probably a pivotal point where I'd gone so hard, so fast for so long on this fight path, but I'd neglected everything else and I'd never sat out any kind of, you know, self-development or therapy and then getting divorced and hitting a low point, I pendulum swung the other way. <laughs> Might be noticing a bit of a um, theme here. But then I probably spent about $50,000, I reckon, in about the space yeah. of two and a half years on seeing psychologists, counselors, hypnotherapists, and just trying to understand my mind, break down my whole life from start to now. And um, spent a lot of time like just wanting to learn more, learn more, learn more, understand, break down and like look at every single part. And then the last few years has been mostly just working with a yoga therapist and uh, yeah, like a yoga therapist in one lineage and uh, another yoga teacher in another. And coming much more back to, I guess, yeah, more of a spiritual practice and, um, yeah, go, going deep on that way, on that path. And that, mm. yeah, that definitely, definitely Thank got me that, through. Man. Like, so yeah, there you go. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So with, um, now like your focus and awareness of this spiritual path, what have been some of the key insights or realizations that have come through for you around just how the world works and how that can be again applied to your everyday life and you know, navigating things like your business your gym that you've got um, mm. navigating things like fatherhood um, what have been like the key lessons in this latest chapter of spirituality that have come through um i suppose i had a I shifted away from like studying Buddhism and trying to practice it on and off for like 15 years and massively dove deep into yoga and not like what we think of as yoga is like doing a handstand on the beach with Lululemon tights and balancing with our legs in funny positions. Um, but like the actual like philosophical and spiritual system or practice of yoga and um, 
yeah, I guess it's like in the last few years, it's made me really realize that like there's certain things that I value and I really want to have in my life. Like I really want my daily practice. I really want a teacher to study under. I really want a lineage to be a part of where it's like, you know, if we've, we want to get somewhere in life, we want to know which mountain we want to get to and we want a roadmap or a path to get there. It's like if I'm lost in the middle of the Amazon jungle and um, there's a bunch of mountains and I don't have a map, a teacher or anything, I'm just going to wander around and be lost for ages. But if, um, you know, if I go, I want to climb up that mountain and I find a teacher and they've got a map and they've traversed the path and they know where to go to get to the top, then, you know, I can follow in their footsteps and learn from their wisdom, I guess, but from they've learned from their teacher who's learned from their teacher. And, um, yeah, it's massively helping with everything from, like, attaching less to finances and money outcomes and um, showing up better and more present, like, as a parent with my kids and really, I guess, just coming back to that yoga practice of trying to, like, clear the lens that we see life through to experience more sustained joy for me. So the um, one of the main lineages I study under, like in Krishnamacharya, it's um, with like the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's, it's not focused on the afterlife because, um, you know, I have my own belief system on that. But say I might spend my whole life, say I was a Christian, which I'm not, but say I was like spending my whole life going to church and praying to Jesus, but then... I died and it was Thor at the gates of Valhalla. I'd be like, oh, damn it. <laughs> or maybe I'd shake my head and become a Tibetan monk and spend my whole life as a monk. And then I rock up and it's, you know, Jesus and God and Mother Mary. And I'm like, oh, no, like I, you know, did the wrong thing. So the, um, maybe, maybe not. But I, so yeah, like that, that, um, that method of like, I suppose, or that pathway to that mountain is very much on like, I want more sustained joy for me in this lifetime. So like maybe I spend my evenings like, you know, reading or doing a bit of self-development or connecting with my partner and my kids where other people might be chasing the sugar fix of, you know, they might um, go out, get drunk, spend some money at the strippers and come home at three o'clock in the morning and wake up and stumble to work the next day. And it's like, they're looking at life through a lens that's, mm. Um, thinking that that's, you know, going to bring them happiness, but that's not sustainable and it's not sustained joy when their bank account's empty and they've got a hangover and um, maybe their part, their mm. relationship falls apart and they're not close with their kids. So it's like, how do I make everything in my life sustainable long-term, like so that I have enough quality time at home with my partner, mm. with my kids, enough time for myself and my practices, and but also enough that I feel like I'm achieving as a male. Like, you know, we like having our mission and our purpose and, which we're out, a little bit outcome orientated in that way and we want to, you know, achieve and um, feel like we're doing something. So it's like getting a balance that's sustainable in all these areas because a lot of the time we can go hard on one thing like chasing, you know, chasing money and building business, but then we're neglecting other areas of our life. So, yeah, the spiritual spiritual practice, I guess, or mm. uh, some of those things like, like yoga has um, definitely helped me to try and balance out areas of my life to make things more sustainable and then, clear the lens that you see life through. So those, it's like those samskaras that like we view life through from our past triggers or traumas. And it's like trying to clear those things so that we can see the true nature of reality, like how it really is that that person in front of us didn't hurt us. Like maybe that person from our past or that feeling that we're getting, that's like a, a trigger from something that's mm. in the past, but that's not from, not from that person we're talking to right now. So we start to like really, you really know yourself, you know, you start to unravel these layers of um, like, I kind of, I like to deviate, I like to view us as like a, say we were a, a flame or something like we would, whether we view that as our soul spirit Purusha and it's like, we put on this meat suit and it's like, we put all these layers and layers and layers and layers on and we kind of, we have all these things to protect ourselves. And I think a lot of spirituality is just turning the mind's eye inward, trying to, you know, understand ourselves, know ourselves peel off a lot of these layers and come back to, yeah, come back to, you know, who we really are. Mm, it's a beautiful reflection on that, dude. I um, I really like something you said in there around what I was hearing was, you know, not, I think some people think of spirituality and religion especially as making sacrifices in this life in order to serve ourselves in the afterlife or the next life or something beyond the point of death. 
And mm. it kind of feels like almost this negotiation of, you know, I'll give up this, but only if I get this back. And it's, it's yeah. certainly not how I view spirituality. And I, I kind of hear that you've, you've reached a similar conclusion where what I, um, you know, what I really love about, you know, this focus on sustained joy in this lifetime, but from a holistic, sustainable level is I really hear this sense of leadership there. Because like the way I view leadership is often through the lens of apex predators like the dingo or the lion or these kind of animals where, you know, they're managing an entire ecosystem, but they're doing it in a way that looks after every single little piece of the ecosystem. And they're doing it in a way that's a long term sustainable view, you know, not consciously, they're just that's default how yeah. they operate. But, you know, as leaders in companies, I have the same view that, you know, we need to have that long term sustainable view. We need to have a view that looks after the entire ecosystem of the company and maximize the level of fulfillment and joy of everyone in that system as well. And you know, it just came across in the way you described spirituality that it's a very similar concept. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. So tell me more, man. Is there anything else that you feel like we haven't covered today that you want to share? with uh anyone listening to this recording um yeah no not too sure i guess um yeah just looking forward to like building and growing and sharing what it is i want to share with the world like i'm um super passionate about running like teens programs in high schools to try and get a lot of this stuff to the youth earlier so they don't need to wait till they're 30 to access it um also like run these like soul warrior day retreats and multi-night retreats where it's um yeah kind of like a combination of everything from like a you know doing some martial arts to doing some yoga to breath work immersion and sound bath and journaling prompts and studying some yogic philosophy and it's just kind of like intermingled all in this way that i i really enjoy and everyone seems to come out having had a really good experience and i am um, living in warrigal it's like i'm an hour and a half out of melbourne and the population is small here so it's hard to to kind of reach the people you'd like to reach. So we just, um, yeah, just started launching a, launching an app soon called Soul Warrior and got like a 12 week program on there called the Conscious Warrior. And um, yeah, like I'm kind of putting all of my life's work lessons and passion into that, which are like, yeah, can't wait. Like it's, um, I'm just finishing up a diploma in clinical hypnotherapy and psychotherapy. So it's going to include like um, hypnotherapy recordings, guided meditations, yoga nidras, as well as, um, you know, some yoga practices to follow along. And then, yeah, the course elements on, yeah, all the self-development stuff. Incredible, bro. I, what I, I really love how much you've turned some of the attention back to the teens as well and just seeing the poetry and that full circle journey for you in terms of the, the pain that you felt at that time of your life and the level of strength mm -hmm. and support that you're going to be channeling to people that may be in similar positions. It's really beautiful. Yeah, I'm hoping to look at um, this year or next year, I want to start to run some kind of like rite of passage for teenage boys, like, you know, boyhood to manhood, like a pivotal moment where it's almost like they take a code of honor or uh, like they're like, this is how I'm going to live my life and this is how I'm going to treat women and this is how I'm going to show up with, you know, integrity and honor and have like a bit of a, um, yeah, a rite of passage type ritual ceremony thing in like a multi-night camping situation or something. And I think that's, um, that's something I'd really like to explore in the next couple of years. So I think that's missing in today's society. Like there's not enough rituals or, um, yeah, the rite of passage thing is huge. I feel like. Yeah. I've, I have heard that said quite a lot, right. Is that, you know, in traditional societies, it's just a given that every boy goes through a rites of passage to become a man. And, you know, these days, what is it like there's hazings and fraternities, but that's not the same thing. Um, there's yeah. like, you know, you might go out and get really drunk when you're 18 or 21 or whatever it happens to be. And again, that's like, it's some kind of initiation, but it's not really into the type of man that necessarily is going to have that long-term sustainable holistic health at the front of mind. So yeah. Yeah. Like what do you see in terms of the, the, you know, what, what do you feel like would be most supportive for teenage boys to step into that chapter of becoming men? I reckon for those that have like a father figure in their life, it'd be awesome to do like a father son retreat. Like I'd love to do something like that where they get to bond and do different exercises um, with, you know, with each other and, you know, get vulnerable and share things they might not have shared and um, everything from like wrestling to 
eye gazing to a fire ceremony to writing forgiveness letters and burning them to um yeah just a lot of stuff like that i think could be really potent but then i feel like there's a a big missing link for those that don't have a dad or a father in their life at that point in time like you get a lot of teens i think males like acting out um because they don't have guidance or a good role model or a present father um whether they're they don't have the option or whether they're not interested or whatever it is but like i think it'd be really good to have like a almost like a tribe you know where there's like a, a group of men that are mentoring a group of younger you know budding men and um they know that they can always turn to those people for for advice or to if they get stuck when they need help and um you might have like you know half a dozen men facilitating a retreat for 20 or 30 um yeah teenagers like 14 to 16 or something and i think you know doing that for three to six nights or something like that i think could be really potent and could form some really epic bonds. Yeah, amazing, man, amazing. For anyone listening to this as well, if if you are looking for something like this, there are a bunch of like amazing organisations and people in Melbourne, especially around mm-hmm. Australia and the world. But the ones I know of are in Melbourne um, that I can definitely point in the direction of. And uh, Kale is also doing some incredible work in this space for for men, adults, and uh, also through his gym and through his one-on-one coaching as well. So. Um, Kel, do you just want to share like where people can find you and how they can go deeper with you if they'd like to explore that? Um, yeah, I'm on Instagram, just Kale Costa on Instagram. My um, partner's just set me up with a YouTube channel as well. Um, and yeah, website's just kalecosta.com. So, and my martial arts dojo is tribemma.com. That's in Warrigal, if you're local to Warrigal. <laughs> yeah, awesome, man. Well, we'll put all those links in the show notes as well, dude. But it's been such a pleasure and an honor to speak <laughs> to you, you, man. And I really respect how much how much of this, you know, this Bushido code you mentioned, this this real sense of honor, respect and artistry you bring into who you are as a man. And I really, uh, really appreciate you sharing that with all of us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Much love, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to Leaders with Heart. We appreciate you being here and helping us spread this mission of seeing the world led by inspiring leaders who are living from their heart and fulfilling those around them to bring the world into a place of harmony and peace. And through our work at Leaders with Heart, we're also engaging in coaching with leaders and organizations across the world. So if you'd like some support in that space, reach out via the website, leaderswithheart.com.au or the links in the show notes. And if that's not your journey and you just want to continue to connect with this vision through listening to this podcast, we massively appreciate you too. You can also share the episode, like, comment, subscribe, leave a review, all the things. And myself and the guest appreciate you massively for supporting this mission. Thank you and have a beautiful week and we'll see you soon.